Howdy folks, it's Scanner here. In this video, I'm going to go through how I decided to paint the terrain from Kill Team Octaria's box set. As you can see, it leads to a nice orky look. I don't have any finished orcs to stand on it, so you're getting Necron standing on it instead. C'est la vie. Uh, it leads to a nice finished orky look without being too messy or too cartoony, which a lot of people seem to fall into. So to start out, just cut out and put together all your terrain. I don't see the point in going through how that's done. It's all covered in the box set instructions and it's just terrain. After that, I opted to undercoat it with Chaos Black Rattle Can just because it's the easiest way to take care of terrain. The first thing I opted to do was my little metallic cheat color which is called Tinny Tin from Vallejo and I'm absolutely in love with this. Whenever I find myself doing any form of metallics it almost doesn't matter what color I'm building up to whether it's brass, bronze, you know, aluminum, um, gold, silver, it does not matter what I'm doing. I'm always starting with Tinny Tin and the reason I'm doing that is because you can kind of heavy dry brush it on in such a way that it leads to these beautiful tones in the deeper shadows and uh, that's the place it's really going to be prominent i've noticed a lot of people out there when they're doing some kind of metal they'll come up from a brown i prefer to just come up from a uh, another metal that's just how i like to do it and tinny tin is my metal of choice for just such an occasion so yeah, start out by dry brushing the entire thing with Tinny Tin. As you can see, I'm happy enough to leave large enough areas of black in certain parts of the model simply because it adds good contrast and there's enough layers of paint going on over this tin and over this black where it's going to add a lot of visual interest and that's what it's all about. What we're trying to do here is build up visual interest and patina. After that, I broke out a little bit of typhus corrosion. It's something I use from time to time in very small areas, primarily just to break up the actual surface texture. I don't want to cover the entire thing in it. I just want somewhere that's going to accept paint a little bit differently to the rest of the model. The, the, the way it works is straight lines pick up paint differently to something like a circular rivet and then the flat areas pick up paint differently to both of those so you want to add a fourth area of potential visual interest to it that's where something like your um your typhus corrosion comes in you can just put it on and it will form a newly textured surface wherever you paint it do it or don't this step you can happily leave out and um, it doesn't lead to anything to be honest that you will even pick up on in the photos it barely leads to anything that you will pick up on when you're actually looking at the model the way i do it it just adds a very slight break to what it is your eye is seeing when you look at the model underneath the rust effects that just makes it feel a little more realistic stops what you're seeing feeling so uniform after the old Citadel Typhus Corrosion, you know what time it is. It's time for that Citadel Rise of Rust. Now, I do like Rise of Rust. It's maybe a little orange, and I wouldn't use it on something that wasn't going to be a metallic. If I was coming up from a paint, for example, I would probably use a, I don't know, a more traditional something like Mornfang Brown or something like that to get my rust effects but when I'm on my metallics I really like the way the riser rust sits on it so I've also noticed I tend to do this ever so slightly differently than other people where I will apply it reasonably heavy in places and then let it sit just for a couple of seconds and then I'll like smush it around from that central location because rust tends to form that way it forms from a point from a point on something like a really good example of the piece of the model that we're looking at now are those hinges if you looked at anything on that structure in real life and thought to yourself what's going to rust here and rust here first it's going to be the hinges so i smack it onto both those big hinges because their layers of metal moisture sits in between them and just rusts up and whatnot um, i also like to do you see me there i'm rusting up an entire panel 
because the way I see it is whatever that was actually pulled from was entirely rusted and once again you're just trying to break up any uniformity there's no reason all these things would have rusted at the same rate or in the same ways or anything like that so that's how I like to do my riser rust I like to like smack it on very ununiform I like to really heavy it up in some places as you can see there I like to especially pick out the rivets and the dents and the place where metal sits upon metal because that's where rust will tend to form the most. So basically you cover the whole thing in Rise of Rust. You want to go pretty heavy with it at this point, at least using my method and you'll see why. So here's a good view of how much of this stuff I'm slapping onto the front of it. This will not remain on the uh, on the, the visual interest of the model. It's going to be covered up by other things. So I would like to start from a place where I have too much than too little. And as I said, I really think the riser rust sits beautifully on top of the tinny tin. And I think visually for what you're seeing, it makes a huge amount of sense. So yeah, cover the entire thing in riser rust. Just go crazy. After that, we want to start picking out a couple of details. So I break out the Evil Sun's Red and I start working away just on these little banners here. Um, the little emblems, I guess, with the orc figures on them. I paint both of them up in the, um, what you call them, Evil Sun's Red. Just two layers, not worrying so much about coverage. Remember, this was painted by an orc, uh, not a person. So you don't really need to worry about what it's going to look like or what the paint goes on like or it being a good paint job. If it's too smooth, it ruins the effect, basically. So think about that when you're painting your orc stuff. If your randomly cobbled together base is just looking too smooth, it's going to murder the visual interest level of an orc hideout or an orc structure. So I like to slap it on and keep it kind of grimy and strange looking. Once the red is done, I like to hit it with a little bit of wolf grey for the whitey parts. It's close enough to white to be visually picked up as white against the red, but it's not so white that it kind of stands out and blinds you and looks too pure, which would be an issue. Um, the same thing as before, you just want to go over stuff reasonably neat, but not tidy. Uh, that's the main thing that I look for when I've been painting these orc structures to make them stand out and appear super, super interesting, is you want the brush strokes within the white to appear, because they were probably put there by some grot who didn't really care about what he was doing. So just give both of them a blast of the old gray or uh, wolf gray from Vallejo once that's done I start coming in with a lead belcher dry brush lead belcher from the old Citadel paints line um, you want to just go over everything. It adds a nice chipped effect to everything you've painted even the white it'll make the edges of that orc, he orc head look weathered and whatnot and you just want to go over it as much as makes sense to you and um, this is where you will set up the tone for the entirety of your table i don't like to have too much of the rust visible so you'll notice i take it down quite a bit in places but this is where you will decide for yourself exactly how rusty you want things to be i like my upwards facing surfaces to be reasonably rusty but i don't see the entire sense of the entire front of the structure being surface or being rusty because rain would like not hang so much on the flats and you just gotta like sort that out in your own head and for your own sake you gotta figure out exactly how much rust or how little rust you want showing in any of these places so just keep dry brushing with the lead belcher until you're happy with the vibe you're getting. Now, with that completed, I can move in and start hitting up some of the details on the model with uh, some primary colors to bring out little details that I want. So what I've decided to do for these models is focus on Vallejo Game Color Dark Green and Vallejo Game Color Magic Blue as my detail work. Why? Because they both sit 
in a nice place in relation to the rust. They either kind of subtly contrast it or dramatically contrast it, which is absolutely fine. They're only going to be covering small areas. I'm using them to go over places like the wires that you can see running across the top and things like that. That's really it. That's all I want to do is just make those little smaller details stand out and matter within the context of the paint job. If you have no interest in doing that, you can just skip it. It's not a major thing. It's just something I am doing. Once I have the wires done in a way I'm happy with, I break out a little bit of Ushabti bone and I start hitting up these lights that are above the doorway. Now, if you want to, you can do some OSL here. I'm not a massive fan of the way it's done, by people of my skill level is what I will say. If I was a better painter, I may consider doing some kind of OSL, but if I was doing that, it would have dramatically changed the overall way that I painted the model. I'm painting it from the point of view of it being daytime. If I was doing OSL there, I'd be trying to set a fixed light source and kind of paint my gaming table in a more diorama-esque fashion. But I'm not. I'm just painting a general gaming table here and I'm trying to keep my brush miles down. So I break out the Ushabti bone and I just make them look like your standard household light bulb almost. The way they've been dipped in that white to creamish colouring to reinforce the strength of the bulb and make it more readily take heat. And finally, just to add a little bit of pop, I start going over some of the uh, top kind of um, orcish teeth that are added there, the metal metallic teeth almost, in a little bit of bronze and I go over my blue wires and my green wires with a slightly mixed true grey just to make the folds and the bends and things stand out ever so slightly to the eye and I go over small details using bronze or a uh, brassy brass I was using, a Vallejo colour called brassy brass. Finally, the little um, gas can down at the bottom, I want that to pop, but I don't want it to be the same red as the signs, so I used the uh, Blood Angels red contrast paint on that. And that was it. That was the basis of most of the colouring. From this point, we're going into a place that's largely unnecessary for most people, but I enjoy doing it because, as I said earlier, I like patinas and I like layers and I like textures, and that's how I build up the visual interest of most of my pieces. But basically what I'm doing here is I'm going over pretty much the entire model with a mixture of odourless white spirit and some black oil paint. Uh, the black oil paint is ivory black, from Windsor and Newton. So I just cover the entire model liberally and then I walk away from it for about an hour or so, just letting all the white spirits evaporate away. After the hour has passed, I come back with some makeup sponges and I start working away, taking off the oil that I have added. I do this reasonably gently at first, taking off most of the excess, finding my tones, finding my colours beneath all the oil and then I switch to makeup brushes that have been soaked and then dried in a napkin in some of the white spirit which really starts to lift off the oil. I just slowly do this, finding my kind of colours beneath, leaving a layer of grime where I want it to be left or going the whole way down to the acrylics where I want those to pop. And that's pretty much my approach to painting this terrain. If you're unhappy with the overall effects of the oils after you're done, you can go back over with a little bit more rise rust and make stuff pop. You can go back over with a little lead belcher dry brush and make stuff pop again and do it that way. But all in all, I was pretty happy with the way things turned out. It looked nice and grimy, nice and dirty, as if it was being, you know, covered in lots of exhaust fumes for years and generally left like a mess. Overall, I was quite happy with the way things turned out. I think it's got nice tones and patinas and colours and visual interest without being too dramatic or too much in any given area. I think there's some nice subtlety across the entire piece and it all works quite well. Most importantly, it's more manageable to do an entire terrain set in this style 
at this speed, it would probably take me, I would say, about two days of focused hobby on a weekend to get the whole thing done. And uh, that's absolutely fine with me. So, yeah, there you go, guys. Hopefully you got something of interest from the video. Um, if you have links to your own painted terrain, maybe on your Instagram or something from the set, please leave it in the comments below so I can have a little peeky peek on what you're doing and maybe steal some of your ideas. So, yeah, that's it, guys. Uh, thank you so much for watching and all the best.